Um, and then, like, it's a headphone, so, like, I hope that's good enough. Also, I have fairy lights now. I'm gonna put them on the wall eventually, but I don't know, like, how. Like, I know how. I've got, like, little clips, but, like, there's, like, a pattern that you gotta follow or something. Why are they off? There we go. No. No, come on. Awesome. Okay. That's concerning. Part one, I say mean things about people. I lost a rank game once, and my team was doing the whole being mean on the internet thing, and I wrote a little rant. If you blame teammates, you're not trying to win. You want to win, but you're not trying. You're not putting in the effort. You're trying to win the game, but not have to actually think about what you need to do to win. It's so much easier to think that if only you had a better team, you would have won. You do this so you don't have to put in the difficult effort of blaming yourself and practicing. If you think you're popping off every game, good. Even if you get like below average teammates some games, if you're truly popping off every game, then you'll win more than you lose, right? And if you're not, then you're not actually popping off, are you? Like yeah, some games are unwinnable because insert game company here is stupid, but if you're doing it every game, and if you do it to people, like you're flaming people, you're being a prick because your mental is too fragile to improve. Hey, wait a minute, this could be a good YouTube video. Part 2, let's solve toxicity. Wow, efficient video is actually just about game design. Do I need like more fairy lights or less fairy lights? In shot. I don't know how they like light up my face or anything. Is this pretty? Am I pretty now? Let's be honest here, I'm not going to be able to fix the mental of everyone who plays video games ever in a YouTube video. And some things aren't worth fixing. I think, you know, as game developers, we have a responsibility to do what we can to make this better. And um, some of this, as Meg Giant so eloquently said yesterday, involves, uh, you know, telling the worst players, like the Nazis, to get the fuck out of our games. Wow, wait a minute, does this video have research behind it? And, like, sources? In my online video game discourse? But before we get into, like, the design side of things, we gotta get into why people tilt. I'm gonna put a number between 1 and 10 on the screen. Guess what it is. If you guessed, congrats! That's the least likely number to be picked. But if you didn't guess correctly, and I'm willing to bet that you're not, like, punching the wall out of rage right now, right? But, like, why is that? It's because we don't tilt at things that we don't care about, like, so... If we want to look at what actually like causes tilt in video games, we have to look at what people care about in video games. Oh, this is a bit of a rabbit hole I got myself into. Now I'm not going to pretend that I know everything about player motivation, that's a whole thing that I know a lot of very smart people have put a lot of time into, so I'm going to piggyback off their work. Not going to lie, just based off what I've seen in games, I kind of assumed there wasn't too too much thought put into like motivation relative to toxicity, but like, oh my god, there are hours of GDC talks on this thing. So let's use that. This is gonna get tangled with my headphone wires. Part 3, what do people care about? Uh, a lot of things is the answer. Uh, this is the gamer motivation model from Quantic Foundry, which is a market research company focused on gamer motivation. Uh, they've worked with companies like Wizards of the Coast, PopCap, and Tencent. This little thing helps devs understand you. We're gonna use it to understand why toxicity happens in Overwatch. We're talking about Overwatch partly because I play the game, but also because they've taken some clear steps to try and reduce toxicity, and we're going to look at that later. Back to Quantic Foundry, we can simplify their model down a bit. So if you look at this, you'll actually notice that competition is only one part. So everyone's going to try and win, right? But not everyone is going to try and compete. Most people aren't going to spend time vauding or grinding or practicing the game. It's just not what's the most fun for them. You can have people who play Junkrat because he blows shit up, or you can have people who one-trick bad characters because they're bad characters. They care more about the challenge of winning with the bad character than the winning itself. You can have people who play certain characters because they just like the character, not their kit, or because their kit is full of text. Some people just play for the art. And also, a lot of people in Ranked aren't here, they're here. They want to be good, they don't want to get good, they don't care about it. And the funny thing is that people who value competition over all else aren't always going to play to win. If you're truly trying to improve, you're not always going to 100% play to win. Some games you'll play to improve, you'll practice, your focus won't be on winning, but on getting better. It's a part of competition, so you need to do practice so you can win. So even though the mode is called competitive, not many people are actually going to be competing. Part 4, the multiplayer toxicity problem is unavoidable. 
Wait, you fought a dude who makes YouTube videos who's gonna solve toxicity in like an hour? I can't even unstraighten this fairy lights. How did this happen? So you have all these players in a ranked lobby. You end up in a situation where people have different priorities. Is everyone trying to win? Yes, of course, winning make brain happy. But not everyone is trying to compete. There's a disconnect there. And that's a nice transition into what exactly causes tilt. To butcher a dude's name, Edgar Shakara, a mental performance coach who's worked with like a whole bunch of people, he wrote an article for the British Brit British? For the British. He wrote an article for the British Esports Association called Why Do I Get Tilted? What Causes Tilt and How to Overcome It? So here's why, and let's break this down a little bit. This is an offense against me. So we can use the gamer motivation model from earlier to figure out what people care about. If you care about winning or competition, someone playing a character that gives you a lower chance of winning is going to be an offense. Likewise, if someone is playing for the challenge of winning by one trick and a bad character, someone asking them to switch to the character that would make the game easier is also an offense. Judging the likelihood of success is low. If you care about winning, and someone is doing something that isn't putting winning first, that might be like annoying. If you're losing, it might be tilting, but if you're winning, it's just annoying. You might avoid them as a teammate, but you're not going to tilt. Blaming something or somebody else. You might get frustrated if you blame yourself, but you're not really going to tilt at yourself. It's fine and even good if people feel frustrated at themselves, it means they feel like they have the power and control to achieve their goals. Judging our coping options is low. But if you blame something or someone else, like the game, devs, teammates, balance, servers, matchmaking, smurfs, like whatever, right? You place the blame on not you, and that's more likely to cause tilt. Having negative or low future expectations. There's no way we can win with this guy. I'm doing all I can. I literally can't do more. I'm in elo hell. I can't climb up these teammates. Like you, you've heard before. This sort of negative long-term thinking is also more likely to cause tilt. If it was just one unlucky game, it might not be like that bad. But it's never just one unlucky game. You like this mug? If I like light it nicely, does it like look better? Did I make the a girl gave this to me? Do you think she liked me joke already? There's gonna be progressively more and more fairy lights in this video. So that's why we tilt. We take offense to a thing that someone or something did that negatively impacts our goals in a game. That thing causes the chance of our success to be low, the thing is someone else's fault, it's out of our control, and it'll impact our future chances of success too. So by having players who value different things in the same multiplayer games, especially with the anonymity of the internet, you're going to have the perfect breeding ground for toxicity. Part four and a half, but the mode is called competitive. But the mode is called competitive. Why do people who aren't competitively motivated play ranked? I don't know. I try to do research on this, but like, there's nothing out there. If I had to guess, it would be for three reasons. A lot of people just don't play comp. Like, if you ever just hop into arcade and Overwatch, there are a lot of game modes there, and you can usually get a queue somewhat quickly, right? The modes are in the game for a reason, and a lot of people play them. But also, Blizzard does try to get people to play ranked. It's presented as the mode that you play eventually, like, once you unlock it. It's presented as the main mode of the game. And there's two reasons for that. Uh, queue times and matchmaking. So, basically, we either have to deal with all these differences in play motivations, or deal with a significantly lower player base, which means, like, worse queue times and worse matchmaking. So like imagine you're Blizzard, right? Like, would you rather have better game quality with a larger player base or deal with this toxicity problem? Like, which one is gonna make you the most money? So it's not for certain, but like this all makes sense, right? Winning make brain happy and money make boss happy. These different motivations just are not a problem that needs solving for game developers. This is gonna be such a long video. Oh my God. I can feel my voice going already. I always feel a little, like, self-conscious on camera. I don't know. I need a teleprompter. I could memorize the script, but, like, let's... Like, I spent, like, two months, three months on this script? I don't know. It's been, like, a long time. I probably put more effort into this script than any other script, so... Yeah, I need a teleprompter. Part 5, devs aren't stupid. Serious? So what have game devs done to try and solve the whole tilting problem? Because like, toxicity in games is a problem that can cost the company money. They don't want toxicity in their games. So there's the stuff most games do, like a reporting system and a message when an action has been taken against a player you reported. Uh, Blizzard also gives warnings to players who are close 
to getting punished for like whatever reason. I used to leave quick play games all the time, like just if I had something else to do, I would hop in for like half a quick play game. But uh, apparently Blizzard doesn't like that, so it helps catch people who don't realize that they're doing something wrong, which is which is great. Need more fairy lights. There was a GDC talk given by a research scientist on the Player Behavior Insights team at Blizzard. Which first of all, it's crazy that they have one, and second, it's a really interesting talk. The research scientist basically says that there are three areas that can cause toxicity or disruptive behaviors, as they put it. It's like they're counting like people who leave games um, as a disruptive behavior and other stuff, but that's the general idea. It's not like just toxicity, it's anything that's like bad behavior, you know. So these three areas that cause disruptive behaviors are lack of social consequences, frustration over different play motivations, and frustration over different play styles. So the anonymity makes it easier to be toxic online than it would be like face to face. And then people get frustrated when their motivations are different, which like we talked about that earlier with the, the gamer motivation table. Different play styles, I, I don't really get. Like the example that they give is playing a meta comp versus experimenting and again i think that just comes down to motivations as someone who's better on competitive pokemon for a while there's different motivations for winning and winning with unconventional strats and experimenting if you're interested in that sort of thing there's a great video by 2016 pokemon world champion wolf click on why experimenting and winning with your favorites is kind of surface level but like variety is still cool but basically right there are a lack of social consequences and there's frustrations from different motivations and these are the issues that blizzard sees that lead to toxicity and wants to address their solutions to these things were endorsements and looking for group endorsements are there for positive reinforcement from peers it's the social aspect the more endorsements that you get from other players the higher your endorsement score is you get loot boxes if you don't get endorsements for a while, your endorsement score can go down, so you get fewer loot boxes, and then other players can see your endorsement score. LFG is a system where you can make a group, give it a description, and then find similarly minded players, which would avoid the situation where you have different people playing for different reasons and tilting because of that. They've also added the avoid as teammate feature, right? That's sort of a band-aid. It helps with the whole having negative or low future expectations thing. Since they've introduced these systems, they've had a 40% reduction in disruptive behaviors, a 130% increase in player reports, which they say means that like players trust the reporting system more, and 50 to 70% of players have given endorsements. So it seems like these solutions have worked, right? These are good numbers. But like, toxicity still exists. Like, you play the game, you play multiplayer competitive games. You know this is an issue, right? So why haven't these solutions gotten rid of toxicity? Well, they've helped. The metrics say they've helped. I could do this. Does this look like a noose too much? Will YouTube demonetize me? Basically, I think these solutions kind of miss the point. The players who are mostly being toxic are the ones who care about competition and improving or those who care about winning, right? Like that's the main source of toxicity or disruptive behaviors if you want to call it that. And I feel weird not offering a source for this, but I feel like it's fairly obvious if you play any competitive multiplayer game. This group of more competitive players who are likely to be toxic, let's call them shitbags for lack of a better word, but also because shitbags is objectively fun to say, shitbags. What do shitbags care about? They care about winning. They'd like it if their teammates also cared about winning so that they had a better chance of winning. But like, remember, tilt needs a perceived low likelihood of success. If they are winning, then they're not tilting. So because shitbags care about winning, do they care about endorsements in LFG? Like maybe a little, like people aren't that one dimensional and you're going to have, you know, some variation, but endorsements are there for positive reinforcement and loss aversion, right? But what's like the actual like currency here? loot boxes, which shitbags do not care about at all, and social acceptance. But it's hard to care about social acceptance when you think that your peers all suck and are trash and worthless and bad. And plus, you'll be a higher rank than them soon or you already deserve a higher rank, right? For LFG, shitbags don't necessarily care about the social aspect and unless they know you personally and know how good you are, in which case they'll, they'll just stack with the people they know. They might not be too likely to make a party. Like, what's the difference between rolling the dice on teammates in matchmaking and rolling the dice on teammates in LFG? You have the option to stay as a team or invite people in rank anyways, like, once you know how good they are. So I don't think these two things actually address the main source of toxicity. I'm sure they've helped and the metrics say they have, and, like, that's great. 
but they've done absolutely nothing to address the shitbags. So what should be done? For those of you that paused the callouts video to like actually read the editor's note and notice the thing about chocolate almonds, this is part of why they're great. Part 6, get good. We're missing something here. We're dealing with toxicity and multiplayer ranked. If we go back and look at what Tilt needs, we can see that the blame for the offense needs to be put on someone or something else. In this case, the blame for losing the game. People think a game is fair when they're winning 70% of the time. So we're gonna have to deal with this problem. No one's winning 70% of their games. For like 99.9% .9 of players, there are a pretty big number of other players that are above them in rank. Like even GMs have top 500s above them. You can win. It is entirely within your power to win games and climb. It's proven by the existence of players who are higher ranked than you. You can even look up those Bronze to GM series that people like to watch and then complain about smurfing and matchmaking. So, like, that's the truth. You can climb. But why don't shitbags think that? Well, to simplify, it's just easier to blame teammates. It just is. So how do we get shitbags to go from tilting at their teammates to realizing that they have control over their games, which would remove one of the necessary elements for tilt? Part 7, the truth. The truth changes people's minds. So let's show the shitbags the truth. Let's show them that it is within their power to win games and climb. At this point, talking to people who tilt and ranked draws some really strange parallels to talking to conspiracy theorists, but let's ignore that. Showing people that they could have won is basically just showing them their mistakes, right? Showing them their mistakes and saying, this is what you need to fix. This is why you lost. This is how you could have had control over the game. So how could you do this in Overwatch? Get rid of medals, but keep stats. So, like, the programming's already there, right? There's no medal for fewest deaths, so this would be pretty easy to implement. The reason that they remove the fewest deaths medal, by the way, it, it's really interesting. We used to give a medal for fewest deaths. We ran into a few issues with doing it. The first was confusion. Players were consistently confused as to whether the medal was for most or fewest deaths. I believe this problem was easily solvable. The second issue had to do with weird behaviors that some players felt compelled to do based on their desire to receive the medal. The medal was okay if it just served as a reflection of what players were already doing, but doing weird things like hiding back at the spawn room to get the medal drove too much bad behavior, so we removed it. But why do medals exist in the first place? One of the things we're always looking at are ways to provide positive notes to players after they finish a game, even when they lose. The medal system was one of those, along with the card voting system during the end of the round. However, the medal system provides only one view of the match results, when why someone earned gold, silver, or bronze can be way more complicated than just reflecting your skill. This is one of the reasons we want to look into systems that can help you understand key questions like did I play well, and did I do something awesome, whether you win or lose. This might be an improved medal system or something else. We'll see. I'm beginning to think that they already know everything that I'm talking about, but just didn't like act on it, which I disagree with, so hey, this video has a point again. So while they know that medals aren't perfect, they were added to give a positive note to players. Okay, that makes sense. It's like an interesting question of whether medals are worth the bad behavior that they bring, with the whole, I have five gold medals, what is my team doing sort of thing, right? Or even if the positive note that they bring is even positive, like if you have win and have medals, you feel better. If you lose and you have medals, you feel less bad, or do you just shift some of that bad from you onto your teammates? And is that a good thing? Am I going to talk a bit more about this later? Is this script a little bit of a mess because I've kept researching and finding out more things and adding them to the script, but I don't care, I'll figure this out later, shut up. But fundamentally, right, you have this issue of you want players to feel good, but you want them to show the truth when they lose. So how do you show them the truth? The stats are really hard. Like Blizzard said, they only show one side of things. So aside from a handful of useful stats, what do you show? Well, you show them the game. Most of this is going to be optimizing how the game is presented to the player so that they get the best information. Don't give them like a dick measuring contest, you want them to compare themselves to themselves. So showing them their own stats is good and you can mess with how stats are presented to make them feel good if you want to keep that aspect of medals, but you will want to avoid the dick measuring contest. It gets a little weird because Overwatch players are used to comparing stats and medals, so even if medals get removed, you might still get people like comparing their stats by like just talking to their teammates. So if that becomes too big of a problem, then you can show stats after the game. So the people who are interested can see them, but the people who aren't don't need to worry about them or worry about comparing them. The way the camera moves when you die sucks. You want the camera to communicate to the player, this is what killed you. If they don't have a clear idea of what killed them, 
they'll be more likely to place the blame on other people to protect their ego. But it's hard to do that when they literally see the way they died and the mistakes that they made for that to happen. So having the camera stop moving when you get shot so you can't say that like you got shot around a corner, that's a good idea. Then you want the camera to look at the person who killed you so you can see from where they killed you. Then you want like a skippable kill cam so you can get an even better idea of what happened. Ideally the prompt is press space to skip the kill cam shows up a little bit after the kill cam starts so players are more likely to watch. When the kill cam is over or they skip it, they spectate their teammates from third person POV. The point of all this is to communicate as much information, as much truth about what's happening in the game to the player. Skippable kill cams are common for a reason and spectating teammates from first person instead of third person has the potential to cause maybe more problems than it solves. Right now you have control over the camera after you die and the camera sometimes ends up behind walls because it moves slightly when you die. And obviously changing metals and kill cams isn't going to like remove toxicity entirely and some people will always be toxic no matter what. But the point is to get the players that tilt because they feel the game is out of their control to see the truth that the outcome of the game is in their control. Is this going to happen for every game? No, some games aren't winnable even with the biggest player base and the best matchmaking. But the point is to get people to realize that they control their games. It's also worth pointing out that I'm not calling everyone a shitbag tilter if you think that it's out of your control that you can't climb. This video is about addressing the people who tilt about that, but just like how this blanket with arms uh, was built for people who use wheelchairs, it benefits me who does not use a wheelchair because it's a goddamn blanket with arms and it's amazing. So addressing shitbags can also help improve the overall quality of the game. It is like not cold in my apartment, so putting this on is like Nah. Another thing is the where is my team argument, where most of the team is like dead or respawning or not at the fight or whatever. So spectating your team after your death helps, you can literally see what your team is doing, and kill cams help, but in Overwatch specifically, right, it can be difficult to tell where your teammates are. If you're experienced at Overwatch, this might sound a little weird, but to new or less skilled players, hi, it can be a little difficult to track 12 people, especially with a lot of non-player things in the kill feed. Hitting tab is the next obvious solution, but the visuals there aren't as clear as they could be. For a comparison, this is what Paladins does with its kill feed and team status UI. You can check who's alive without hitting tab, which is fantastic for new players. You can see HP bars, you can see alt charge, it's a lot more clear and accessible. So presenting this information better, even if it's just changing how the tab menu works, making it a bit brighter and more clear, could help communicate the truth better to the player. This doesn't have to be default either, it can just be a setting. That's within the player's control, so it's fine. Show average stats for ranks. So in Overwatch you can view your own stats, and it's like fairly in-depth, so obviously Blizzard has access to this stuff. If you had an option to view stats like this on say a character by character basis, this could both help people realize how well they're doing, and give players who want to improve a goal to aim for. Stats aren't very good at telling a player what they're doing well, but they are very good at telling a player what they're doing poorly. It's hard to say you deserve a higher rank, which most players believe because Dunning-Kruger is a bitch, when your stats tell a different story. Then, when you show them the game, if you communicate everything super well, you kind of just have to hope that they see the truth. And then they can look into ways to improve, they can fix the mistakes that you showed them, and they can take control over their games. It's kind of hard to provide ways to improve to players beyond like the very basics of learning how to play the game, but assuming that you're communicating information very well to the players, what can you do after that? Show them pro games. Uh, this is kind of Overwatch specific, right? If you want to try to improve, you're going to watch someone who's good at that thing, and you're going to take the best parts of what you see. You can look up like whichever hero they played on whichever map, and then show them VODs of a pro player playing that hero on that map and winning. Maybe like a setting enabled for top 500 players, or from the Overwatch League replay viewer if they have that downloaded. If you have multiple VODs to choose from, then you want to show them the one where the pro player plays against a similar comp, like if a certain DPS was giving them trouble, show that DPS. If you can't do that, then try to get a similar tank lineup because tanks dictate the flow of the game. I guess it'd just be a singular tank in Overwatch 2 and that's assuming tanks still dictate the flow of the game but you get the concept. Something that might be a bit harder to do would be to direct players to content creators who make educational content. It'd be a bit weird choosing certain creators and the implementation of how you display and recommend them would be weird too. Like you wouldn't want the players to feel like you're saying hey shitter go and watch these people fix your mental and get good so you don't cost us money even though that's like exactly what you're saying. So I'm not sure about this one but it might be something to look into. So overall right this isn't necessarily about stopping players from being able to tilt but more addressing the most common source of tilt, understanding it, 
and then redirecting that frustration of losing towards the players so they can improve and finish with their end goal, which is to win more games and rank up or enjoy the process of competition. <sighs> There's too many fairy lights now. Part 8, Toxicity is a Cursed Problem. There's a GDC talk about a thing called a Cursed Problem that I reference a lot in this. It's linked below with all the other things that I reference. Basically, it's a problem that can't be solved without sacrificing something. Toxicity in multiplayer games is a cursed problem. You can't have communication without having toxicity, and you can't have a competitive team game without having communication. The solutions I gave don't sacrifice much of anything because they don't solve the problem, they just help it a little bit because no one's addressed the shit bikes before. There are four ways to sacrifice things in cursed problems. Barriers, gates, carrots, and s'mores, and Overwatch has used every one of those except for s'mores. A barrier is just straight denying one of the things. If you can't communicate in a multiplayer game, you can't be toxic, but you sacrifice that communication. This is left up to the player in Overwatch, like you can mute people and hide chat if you'd like, but it doesn't 100% get rid of toxicity, like I'm sure we can all think of ways to be toxic without voice or text chat. League of Legends is doing something with barriers, they're getting rid of all chat or match chat. So they're sacrificing some fun moments in match chat for making toxicity less of a problem. A gate is a limit on one of the things, limiting individual responsibility. Tilt needs the blame to be on someone else, right? Overwatch built some ways of taking back control into their game. If your sports aren't healing you, you can use health packs or like switch to Roadhog or Soldier. If your tanks aren't making space, you can switch to something that doesn't need as much space to work with, or you can make your own damn space with Brig. <laughs> if your DPS aren't killing things, you can switch to Roadhog. Huh, I wonder why this guy gets picked so often. Or switch to Zen. Does this help the toxicity situation? Is it even correct or going to help you win? Well, probably no to all those things, but it's interesting that it is an option in the game. Carrots encourage the good thing. So in this case, uh, encouraging teamwork can be nice. It's basically endorsements. Also, assists. Have you ever actually thought about why assists sister in the game? It's because of this thing that I'm naming the Ocean's Eleven theorem. Ocean's Eleven is a movie where 11 people bust into a casino and steal all the money. It's a very sophisticated casino and every one of the 11 criminals has their own part to play. So in Overwatch, you want to feel like one of those 11 criminals. The game is designed with roles and characters that perform those roles. You want to perform your role, have your team perform their own roles and win the game. When your team like pulls together, right, if they pull off like a, a bash shatter or a grav combo or if you like peel for someone and save them or like even some combination of those things, right, like it feels good. Team play feels really good. But assists aren't really necessary. A kill feed could just be a death feed, just show who's died. But it shows you kills and assists to show you that, yeah, you're, you're awesome. Teamwork, yeah, it's positive reinforcement. But this also sort of maybe definitely has the effect of making it easier to blame teammates. Heroes in Overwatch fit into a role, right? You have tank, DPS, and support. And it gets more specific, certain heroes do certain roles within those roles. Which means, if you want to do a thing, you need a certain character, or one of a handful of characters. So if you think you need to do a thing to complete your goal, usually winning the game, let's say you think your team needs a shield so you can walk through a choke, and if your team isn't picking the hero that you think you need to walk through the choke so you can win the game, you're not happy. Usually this comes down to politely asking the tanks if they perhaps wouldn't mind playing a tank with a shield. Again, is this true, useful, and will it actually help you win the game? Probably yes, but that's not because it's the best option, it's because the player is shifting the blame. Like obviously it's easier to win with a more standard comp, but instead of the player looking for what they could do, let's say, play around not having a shield, they shift the blame onto someone else. They're going to play the way they think is best, and that way it needs a shield. So if they play that way without a shield, they're gonna feed. But they could just change the way they play. But like, this sort of thing will happen regardless of game design. The point is that by having each hero do a very specific thing, not having that hero can become a common reason for tilt. Now I'm not saying that this should be changed, even though I do think that the common Overwatch map design of a few tiny doors into big open spaces is awful and sucks and should change, and it looks like the maps in Overwatch do fix that, especially if you can combine the fact that there's only one tank. But basically, Overwatch just does a very good job of making you feel good. And when you feel good, you feel like you did well, and you lose, then it's gotta be your teammates' fault. Because you did good. After all, you had three medals, one gold medal, a card at the end of the game, you got play of the game, and you did all that without a shield tank? You did so good. It's gotta be your teammates' fault. So I think Overwatch should really be careful of how they sprinkle on these feel-goodifiers. Sprinkle. Ooh. 
I'm like a cat. Look at this. This was such a good purchase. But now the last type of sacrifice that you can make to fix a cursed problem, s'mores. Uh, so s'mores are basically take the bad thing and make it fun. A good example is um a certain game. So this game was going to be a multiplayer, free-for-all, beat-em-up fighter sort of thing. And that probably sounds really weird. You've probably never heard of a multiplayer, free-for-all, beat-em-up fighter sort of thing. And there's a good reason for that. The idea was to take the awesome, I'm killing everything from beat-em-ups and the depth and tactics from fighters like Street Fighter 2. And that sounds awesome. But you can't have that. You know why? Because of goddamn politics. But basically you want this competitive game, right? So the player who's best at your game starts winning. But the other players, they realize that. So they gang up on the best player, which like that makes sense. The other players don't want to lose. So this game isn't a multiplayer free-for-all beat-em-up fighter sort of thing. It's Game of Thrones. It's Survivor. You want to play this game as a competitive fighter, which means no politics and the best player wins. But you also want to play to win, which means politics. So it's a cursed problem. It cannot be solved without sacrificing something. This multiplayer free-for-all beat-em-up fighter sort of thing ends up being like a really messy and chaotic and crazy game. So what if we leaned into that? Let's add some randomness. Let's add some cool moves that players can focus on. Maybe it's not going to be like insanely competitive. Maybe the best player won't always win, but there's still a ton of depth and it's just messy fun. And then you get Smash Bros, which is like a fantastic game, right? But you can see how I had to give something up, um, that competitive integrity to be as good as it is. If it wanted to go the other way towards the competitive fighting game side instead of the beat em up side, it had to give up the randomness and the 3 to 4 player options. We don't know that Smash Bros did this by the way, they, they could have just come up the game the way it is, but it's a good example. So anyways, take the bad thing, make it fun. How does this tie back to Overwatch and toxicity? A lot of these examples come from the GDC talk directly, but funnily enough, the, the speaker doesn't give an example for s'mores for toxicity in multiplayer games even though he gave examples for barriers and gates. And that's because this is a really weird thing. How do we make toxicity fun? The only thing that I can think of, and it's like almost definitely a horrible idea, would be to add a commendation option for best shit talk. That's a bad idea, right? That's definitely a bad idea. I mean, I'd love to see it, but... Is it a bad idea? Part nine, fun. So something also worth pointing out is that like we play games for fun, right? And we talked about why people enjoy things and what people care about. So hopefully we're on the same page that it is within your power to win games. However, that doesn't mean that those external factors go away. You can still get bad matchmaking or bad servers or bad balance or like whatever it is, right? You can still have control over your games and still have those things and that can make playing the game unfun. So if you're not having fun with the game, even if you recognize that the games are within your control, and especially if you're only having these issues with one game, then it might not be worth playing that one game. This gets very close to blaming something you care about on an external factor with all like the other aspects of Tilt, but at the end of the day, we are here to have fun. So from a game design perspective, it's worth addressing Tilt, but it's also worth addressing the reasons that people Tilt that are controllable from a game dev standpoint. Part 10, conclusion. So, <laughs> this video was weird to research. There's like so much out there about like tilt controlled mobile games. It's worth pointing out that for Overwatch 2, there is a way to tell if your teammates are alive or not, which I talked about. Uh, it's not a UI change, but a sound design one. While it might seem on the surface like they're just taking that from Valorant. The real point of this change seems to be making players aware of how many players on each team are alive. I don't know if that's specifically for toxicity or just general game design stuff, but it helps both and that's cool to see. How does this look? I feel like I'm glowy. TLDR, toxicity in video games sucks. Don't be mean, kids. The devs tried to fix it, but they either didn't correctly understand why toxicity happens or didn't think it was worth addressing 
so those solutions didn't work out as well as they could have. When I messed with my YouTube schedule so that I could put out videos like this, if you look in the description, you can maybe see like half the research that I did for this. Like this was really fun. I got a lot out of it. And yeah, I hope you guys enjoy this sort of content. I appreciate y'all sticking around until the end. Links below, hit the buttons, yada yada. So yeah, hope you guys enjoyed and I will see you all next time. Bye bye.